Matt Williams is with us. Matt, good morning to you. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, Shane. Good to be with you. You've had a, an interesting week. Um, did you turn off your social media? Are you aware of the um, the, the brouhaha? I turned it off, but uh, I have wonderful people like you reminding me all the time, Joe. So it's it's uh, it's good of you. <laughs> Very good. So. Um, what what what's your instinct now about the the discussion that's happening around concussion and and your take on it in particular? I, I look, Joe, look, my point being right now leading the discussion on concussion is journalists and lawyers. With science last, we have to reverse that. Science has to come in front. That was my whole point. I didn't think Nick White should have returned to the field. My point was I am not in a position to decide if that's right or wrong. Now, th- that was it, and that's offended a whole lot of people. And, and look, if, if they're offended, you know, I can't control that. But um, you're not qualified, I'm not qualified. Uh, the vast majority in the sporting community are not qualified to rule on this. We have to turn it to science, and we need really good science, not half-baked science that starts – with a proposal that we're going to find a problem. Let's set out to find a problem because we have to understand that in science, correlation uh, does not mean causation, okay? So in other words, just just because you get some numbers doesn't, you can't relate that back. We, I have had numerous uh, concussions from the time I was a teenager until I was in my 30s. My generation was managed very badly. We were put back into the game straight away. When we were older, we usually consumed alcohol straight afterwards on the Saturday night, and then we were back in full contact on the Tuesday. I have skin in this game, but I will not have journalists and lawyers trying to tell us what the science is. That's my point. Can I now, start, can we can we tease that out because that that's interesting, right? And I guess there's there's one other aspect to this that I think is important to just bring into the conversation and that's the education of the general population and yeah. so when people are watching at home like we probably don't have live access to the medical staff's conversations around what's happening so I, I would feel like there is a, an onus on all of us as part of the the entertainment industry to amplify some of the the issues around this and and I think oh, oh. that's that's important. Where I'm, you know, I'm I'm not a scientist, but um, but we have talked to a lot of scientists about the issues around this. And even if there's doubt about what we think, it's important sometimes to amplify that doubt in a responsible way. Uh, I- exactly. Um, the, the trouble we have now is we have fear. So what what do journalists want? And I'm not suggesting um, yourself or, or this program, but. Generally, journalists want sensationalism, and that creates fear, right? And that that has happened. There is huge fear in the community over this. This started with a movie concussion. It's all moved down the track. From that fear, um, lawyers lawyers can come in and, you know, really try and create some money from that fear. And in all this process, we haven't really got all – the answer, we, I'm not, and I, people have made out I'm trying to say concu- uh, head injury is not real. I mean, that is just, you know, that's trite. That's not what I was saying. Uh, and, and I have never said that. If you read any of the articles I've written over the years in the Irish Times, you can see I am saying, I, I'm totally understand that's the case. I, can, I, I am part of the, of the story. I am part of that story. What I am saying is that the fear has overtaken uh, what what we need to do now in the Nick White scenario. Let's come. Let's roll back a bit. Dave Parecki, the Australian hooker, in the opening twenty minutes, got a bang. We couldn't see what happened on the field, and he was removed. He failed his test and was removed from the game. The process worked. The science worked. The player was protected. Now, what happened with Nick White as it transpired was the um, match doctor. So remember, this is an independent doctor. Everyone started saying, started saying, oh, as soon as he got injured, you could see the Australian physio talking on his uh, microphone as if there was some conspiracy theory going on that they could manage to get him off. I mean, it's just, you know, again, ignorance. He is talking to the coach saying we're losing. White is going off for a HIA. We need to get organised. And then you see Dave Renny saying, well, get, them, get, uh, 
get the next player organised, let's get our replacement scrum half on the field. That's what that was about. But as soon as Nick White walks off the field, he's handed to the independent referee. So what occurred was the re- independent referee was looking at Nick White tackling uh, Mac Hanson where he hit the ground. They thought that was the injury. Now, it wasn't the case. He bumped. He hit Josh Van der Fleur's, uh, knee. So when he came off, yet he passed his HIA. So at what point do we as rugby people intervene into that science? Does dust the pitches make that right? Now, now the referee, the, the match, of, uh, match doctor has said that he didn't see that and subsequently that's moved. My whole point in this process is it has to be medical. Now, people come and say, oh, you can't be medical. Well, if it's not medical, what is it? Do we, do we say it worked with Dave Parecki? But we don't like, we don't want it. It didn't work with with Nick White. We changed. So it's it's a it's look it, to me, it's a storm in a teacup about people jumping up and down about an error that a doctor made. Okay, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot in this, right? And and just to spill back to the 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 fear and um I I I mean maybe maybe I'm biased because I'm in the journalism profession. I don't really believe that journalists gain much from fear. Um, I I'd have to say that the people we've spoken to. Like so, we had um, Nobby Styles' son John Styles on, and his dad um, suffered dementia, and they think it's connected to football. D- uh, Dawn Assel, um, uh, Jeff Assel's daughter, has been on the show, and they—they're not. We're not generating fear by speaking to those people. We're trying to tell their stories where they don't believe that the sport of football, in particular, was responsible to their parents. And their concern, Chris Sutton has spoken on the show as well about his dad and, and the concerns that he has for the concussions that footballers suffered when they were when they were heading uh, heavy footballs. And the fact that kids still today are practising headers under six, under eight, under ten. And we're not really sure of what the science is. I, I think to your point, the science hasn't fully caught up yet to prove causation. But there's a concern that heading the ball repeatedly might lead to brain injuries and I think that's the the grey area here where if I'm a parent I'm concerned that rugby seemed to get it right in one incident at the start of the game but didn't get it right in the second incident and if that was one off I'd say sure it's a storm in a teacup but unfortunately these bits where players are concussed and subsequently are removed and stood down but yet they have been allowed to go back in would suggest to me that the process isn't working Either, either from the medical side or the science side or the, the common sense side, that whatever, whatever the coagulation of those um, bits are isn't working at the moment. And I think that's where the conversation could get to. Joe, I, I think you're absolutely right with the head injuries in football and hitting the ball in any sport. Um, you know, like I, 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 I still, I was in Dublin last weekend and I saw kids riding around on bikes with no helmets. Like head injury to children uh, is most likely to occur on bikes or skateboards, horses, that sort of thing where there is a considerable fall. But it's the accumulative effect of of uh, knocks to the brain. So yeah, look, I think we should. But personally, and and again, you know, I, I certainly think we should take a stop heading the ball uh, in in junior junior football. There is a whole lot of things we should be doing so uh, that's one side of the story and what's happened to Nobby Styles and these guys I know is true because there's there's scientific papers one of the first scientific papers written on this was way way back in the 50s and it, it uh, investigated um, uh, a whole lot of former professional soccer players in England that had dementia in, and they were in, a, in a, uh, homes and they were from the 1930s and, it, and they they came up with the idea that it was from heading wet, heavy leather balls that they played with in those days, or the constant heading of the balls and head clashes as you went for the ball. So we know that's, that it, historically that that's the case and we should stop do things to stop it. We, we are trying to stop those things in rugby. Now, in sport, if you're going to play sport, unfortunately things occur. So let's, let's get to that point. It's how we manage it. It's how we manage it. Was the process that Nick White... Um, went through correct well the, on, on certain aspects you could say it wasn't because they missed the the fact that his head hit josh van der Fleur's knee right so we've got to say they missed that that's for sure but then he passes his hia 
that's where it gets complex. And then people say to me, well, HIAs, the HIA tests are not perfect. Okay, I'll, I'll accept that. But then what do you do with Dave Parecki who fails his HIA? This all points to me, Jer, that we, we, we need to increase our, um, our vigilance. So this was a, there was a visual missing of Nick White and we need to increase the science. The more we increase it, the more we protect the players, the better. But there, here is another important point. There was no malice in that on Saturday. There was on Saturday night. There was no way anyone was trying to game the system. There was no way people were trying. Oh, we're trying to put him back on. That was false. There was a loophole in the system. And I will say, in rugby, in 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 the defence of the doctors, across the season, they are getting the vast, the overwhelming majority of these cases right. There is a supreme um, caution now out there in rugby that there wasn't a decade ago. And I also have to say in the defence of the doctors, I work with a lot of doctors in four different countries. I'd never met one that didn't put the welfare of his players number one, not absolutely number one. Was that an error? Well, obviously looking back, some people, you know, Nick White shouldn't have got on the field. In defence of the doctor, he passed his HIA. Again, where does that leave us? We, we can't have it both ways. We can't say the science works for, for Dave Parecki and it doesn't work for there. We, we, we've, got to, we've got to just follow the science and lead it. That's not going to be an easy journey. That's not going to be perfect. And there's an example on the weekend. But it's much better than journalists and lawyers leading it than, than ha- than, than, uh, and having science last. We have to have science first. Can you understand, um, I guess, Matt, why, why it was the story out of the weekend? Like, I suppose we, we talk about that word fear and it often comes up, parents of, of young kids that are sending yeah. them out to play rugby, there is that fear of sending them out because of, the, I guess, the, the number of concussions in the game at the moment. Like, I guess since the weekend, can you see how the Nick White issue has been the story out of the match as opposed to, you know, anything, that, anything else that happened on the pitch? Yeah, we made it the story. And I said that at the time. Andrew Trimble said it when we were on TV. He said, if we leave with this, we're going to make it the story. Sure enough, we did. Um, and, it, and that's a shame because it was a story, but we, we made it by televising it, the story. There's no two ways about that. Um, and, and look, rugby needs to front it up, and I guess we are, by, rugby is fronting it up. But, th- th- and this is my fear, look, like kids in, in sport right now, we're not competing against football or basketball. This is not this is not rugby against other sports. We're competing against apathy. We need children playing sports. We need children putting down devices. We need children turning off laptops, turning off TVs, going outside and being active, not to play for Ireland, not not to win competitions, but to be healthy. We have an obesity crisis in society, Western society, absolute obesity crisis. I'm seeing kids in Australia at the age of 13 and 14 that can barely run because they're caught up in apartments, not getting out and doing stuff. That's that's the truth. I've physically seen that. And now on top of that, and, and then you have the social aspect of getting on with people, of communicating, again, of turning off phones. We need this for society. And we're putting fear into junior sport that shouldn't be there. Sh- junior sport should be as safe as we can make it. And th- th- if I'm a professional rugby player, I sign up for it. If I'm a boxer, you know, I, I step in that ring, I sign up for it. That's okay. It's your brain, you do what you want with it. It's your body, you do what you want with it. But we shouldn't be making it so fearful because it's wrong. It's a lie to make it this fearful that parents are not wanting their kids to play junior sport. Yeah. I, that, is, I, it, that is the tragedy in this, this I, process. I think you're, you're talking there about the principle of informed consent, really. I, you know, I don't think 16-year-olds fully understand when they're signing up to head the ball or to play rugby what the, the long-term dangers are. I, the, only, the other thing I'd, I'd say about that, too... Jim, is if that, I just interrupt you there, though, it's their parents. Their uh, parents have to. It, it's it's not the kids I'm worried about. The kids want to play. It's their parents. Well, so we have to educate their parents. I I I think that's exactly the point. I do think too that sometimes we need to intervene when players are making decisions in the immediate short term. Because if you ask a player, 100%. like there's, 100%. there's that there was that survey done years ago. If I pr- give you a gold medal now, but you're going to die in ten years, how many athletes will take it? And 
at the time, the figure was off the charts. It was something like 80% of, of athletes were like, yeah, I'll take a gold medal. Of course I will, because that's their, that's their identity. And, and so many athletes you speak to in their 40s regret the level of commitment that they put into at the detriment of like relationships, uh, personal development. So that's the bit where, um, I'm to, to go back to your point about the science, like what science do you feel we need to 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 lead and to um because like we do speak to the scientists and and in fairness we had um the guys from mickey collins from upmc on who was like look we think concussion is very treatable we want everybody who gets concussed to get the right treatment and you know nine times out of ten we're going to get them back playing the sport yeah. and and that was a, a story that kind of shocked a lot of people to hear somebody saying i've dealt with literally thousands of concussions over a decade and we've had great outcomes in it we, we covered that story and we covered it really well um, so, you know, we, we are offering the scientists who tell the, the positive outcome stories a platform as well. But I'm just, I'm not sure that, um, you know, journalists having conversations about it is damaging to the sport or creating this climate of fear. Um, well, I, Joe, I can tell you that, um, and and I, I, I don't listen to all the show. I follow your show at the, the, the station. I don't listen to all the, obviously, you can't physically listen to them all. Um, but I, I do know on a, on a number of other platforms, um, BBC in particular, they do lead with some very troubling um, stories on it, and that has created fear in the community. Now, not every journalist and not every story, obviously. We're, 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 again, we're talking extremes here. There, there, there needs to be some balance. But the stories of saying that, of saying, you know, I, I don't want to be – somehow I've – found myself in this position where I'm almost talking against all this and I, I don't want that I've been trapped into this. I've been trapped into this myself yeah uh, and I will say I thought we we're coming on the show to talk about yeah that. yeah I know it's just because it, it, here I am we spent 15 minutes talking about concussion which I am not an expert in I am not an expert I am not the scientist to be talking about this I am a coach. I've had concussions I'm highly interested I've done my own little bit of research and I observe society. Um, if we come back to what we were saying, I encouraged my son to play rugby. I encouraged all my children to play sport. Now, he, he didn't love the game the way I love it, and he has stopped playing. He had great fun. He has great friends, and he stopped playing when he was 19 or 20. That's his choice. But he is socially uh, um, well-adjusted. He uh, is very healthy. He has uh, uh, a good, you know, he, he's not obese, he's, he's, he's got a good physique, he's, as in he's healthy physique, he's good body weight, he's got a good picture about himself. So he got the that's benefits of the sport, yeah. Absolutely, and that's what I'm saying, Joe. I'm not talking about about elite end sport. There's, there's two, this, this is damaging um, people getting involved in community sport that, that are never going to be international players, that are never going to do, and, and I agree with your comments about... Um, elite end of sport. Look, to, to make it in the elite end of sport, you've got to be obsessed and you've got to be, it's not a normal lifestyle. You know, Steve Gerrard said once, to be a professional sportsman is a very abnormal, uh, sports person is a very abnormal lifestyle. You have to be obsessed. You have to have a touch of, of the obsession about you. And I know I've got that in me. And it's, it's, it can be very dangerous. And if you, when we talk to a lot of the guys when we retire, we all often speak about how obsessed and selfish you are. You have to be a very selfish person. Now, that's one end of society, and they're the people that make bad decisions about, about their health and brain injury. They want to get back, especially in rugby. You know, if you're a 100-metre sprinter, that doesn't, doesn't affect you. But that's why we have to protect them in rugby. That's where the science comes in to protect people. That's the discussion on Nick White. But the discussion on Nick White, unfortunately, is, dis is discouraging, or, or Nobby Styles, is discouraging parents allowing their children at 10 or 11 to go and play a community sport. That's the damage to me. That's the real damage. And we have to try and avoid that. Yeah. And look, I suppose not to relitigate that, I guess um, I would say having these conversations is forcing world rugby into acting in a way that might actually end up making it much easier for parents to go, yeah, I, I, I trust that organisation. I think they're on top of it. And, they're, you know, in fairness to them, they're taking it seriously. You would say that part of them taking it seriously has been the fact that these cases are brewing. Certainly with the NFL, they weren't going to do anything until the um, the players started, like, in many cases, killing themselves and leaving their brains to science. So it, I, I, know, I know you're saying it shouldn't be the lawyers, but sometimes, unfortunately, society changes because 
the lawyers take a case, the case gets won and everybody goes, maybe we should fix this to prevent ourselves from being open to litigation again. Oh, gee, there's so much I want to say about the lawyers. Will, we, the case. will we talk and about the rugby? We can't. I, I can't. Yeah, fair enough. Will we talk, just, about, will we talk about the rugby instead? To, to finish, yeah, Go we on. will, mate. Yeah. Finish, to finish on this, finish on this. So everyone is clear. Everyone is clear. Head injury is real. We need to, we need to uh, absolutely look after people. That is, that is the case because I'm in that case. Second part is science has to lead it. And the third part is we are going to make errors on the journey. Saturday night where Nick White, that, that can be conceived as an error. And we're still up there saying whether it was an error because he passed his HIA, no, nothing else. So there, there, there's the, he, we saw him bang his head, he passed his HIA. Dave Parecki didn't pass his HIA. So we still have more to do with the science to protect the players. That's the point. Not coaches, not journalists, not lawyers, scientists. And we need to listen to that science. Sorry, mate. No, fair I, enough. You dragged I, me into that, chair. Yeah. You dragged well, wait, me into that. Well, wait, I thought it was, I thought it was important to... I'm going to run out some walls, but here we are. Well, I, did, I did think it was important and to give I'll you an opportunity to... I'll turn off my Twitter for another week. Yeah, fair enough. I know, I, I, look, um, I, I thought it was important that you get the opportunity to explain that because, um, you know, uh, there's, there's been a backlash to your comments and, um, you know, sometimes it's difficult to get the full breadth of your thoughts across um, in a short period of time. So, and I, look, I've no doubt you'll get sucked into writing about this over the next few months too. So I look forward to um, further thoughts. Either that or you're like, never again. I'm not going near it, Joe. And, and i got to say to all those people that, you know, threw things at me, um, look, you know, you're, you're more, than, more than entitled to your opinion. But anyone that starts talking against science in this, you're wrong. Right? Anyone that goes against the science. And me too. If I've gone against the science, I'm wrong, and I'll, I'll go back. You've got to follow medical science, not anything else. Um, how did Ireland play over the three games? Will, will Andy Farrell be happy or a bit concerned about the patterns of play that emerged um, from games one, two, and three? At the end of that, when he's going, okay, we're, we're trending in a direction. Is that direction good, all good, mm, a bit up in the air? Um, I've got to get my thoughts together and the after going through all that. <laughs> Mate, look, I, look you, you can't finish the season being number one in the world um, without giving great praise and um, kudos to the whole organisation. The 12 months from November last year to where we are now has been a radical change, not, not a, a revolution, not an evolution. And after that radical change last November, the, the team has progressed and grown and developed and moved forward. It's been, um, it's been a superb 12 months. You know, only a loss to France and Eden Park uh, against New Zealand. It's staggering. The, the one – and so we have to celebrate that and we do have to um, praise everyone involved with it. The really interesting point where world rugby is now – the top there is there's nothing between the top ten teams. So let's let's just look at last Saturday night's opponents, Australia, who are now ranked eighth, uh, which is the lowest they've oh, I think it's the lowest they've ever been in the world rankings. Now they've lost to one, two, and three in the world this season. They've lost to Ireland, France, and New Zealand. New Zealand by one point, France by one point, Ireland by three points. There is nothing between the top eight to ten teams. There is a, there's a cigarette paper. On any given day, anyone can boot each other. Now, so what does that mean? It means Ireland have got nothing, cannot rest on their laurels. France are also on the uh, 13 winning, uh, a 13 game winning streak. So uh, that makes it, uh, puts Ireland in a really good place, but there is absolutely no security in that place. Everyone around them is capable of booting them, on any given day, which is wonderful for, for the game, wonderful for a World Cup year coming up and really exciting for the next six nations because it is exceptionally close and tight at the top of world rugby. We, we've kind of touched on this this week, uh, Matt, since the weekend and, and you know Jack Crowley has uh, had to step in when, when Johnny Sexton was, was pulled out very late. Ross Byrne really stepped up with that kick late on as well on, on Saturday night. Do, do you think it's the case that heading into the Six Nations, we need those players, those understudies, to have had that experience of being on the pitch in big games. Like, should there be moments during the Six Nations where 
you know, those players are given a chance. Johnny obviously won't want to, to step aside, but heading into a World Cup, you need to have that strength and depth to win. Oh, absolutely. And that's been our fault at numerous World Cups. You only have to look, you know, Ian Madigan had to step in uh, against Argentina from memory. It was 2015. You know, when, when or if uh, uh, Johnny Sexton, who without doubt remains at the peak of his powers, but his body is 37 years old. And if he gets injured at the World Cup, he'll be 37. If he gets a slight injury like he did on Saturday, what happens? What if what happens? That's in the warm up before they play South Africa. What if it's in the warm up for the quarter final? One of Ireland's great problems it, it, it can be um, encapsulated in Joey Carberry's career, where he up until last year, even though he had 34, 32 caps, 30-ish caps, only four of those were against Tier One nations. And sometimes we're given the caps in, in the Six Nations against Italy. You, you know, you, the only way you learn to deal with the pressure and learn to be on the big stage is to be on the big stage. And there's without doubt that helped Crowley. Uh, and my, I don't think he's the answer just yet, but he is a really promising player. He's a player of the future. And he did a, gr- a really competent job in very difficult circumstances on Saturday. He will have uh, learnt from that and grown and moved forward, which is really, really great. As did Ross Byrne coming on. So I still think we haven't seen the best of Ross Byrne on the international stage. He's superb with Leinster. If we just looked at provincial form, he would be star- he would be on the bench every time because he is playing superb rugby in that system. He just hasn't done it at an international level. So it, it, it's, it is definitely good. Uh, McCluskey was great. Was, O'Brien was great. Was, uh, Finley Bielham's been fantastic for that. Uh, all, all those players that played it across the series that got their chance against South Africa, to a lesser extent Fiji and Australia, they're going to stand us in great stead, really, really good stead. Matt, we leave it there. Good stuff. Thanks a million. Cheers. Pleasure. It's uh, Matt Williams there giving us some thoughts this morning.